Hello, everybody. Uh, hope everybody's had a great week. Uh, it has been a very challenging week for yours truly, but also a very fulfilling and rewarding week. I have learned that one does not obtain or achieve uh, any progression in life uh, without challenges. Uh, and I am one that has conditioned my mind to be okay with having challenges. I don't see my progress in the circumvention of the vicissitudes of life or all other challenges and disappointment. I tell people often that while pain is inevitable, suffering is a choice, meaning that you will not get past pain in this life, but choosing to identify with the pain and wallow in it is suffering. And so for that, um, you know, I enjoy overcoming challenges. Uh, it, it makes me a better person. Uh, and I am actually here uh, because there's a challenge that needs to be overcome. And luckily, I, over I overcame this challenge uh, a long time ago. Uh, I am adamant about being accurate with what I disseminate. However, I'm human and I make mistakes. And those who have followed me for any stretch of time know that when I make a mistake, I apologize for it. I print an, a retraction and I do a video whenever necessary. And so I wanna do that now. I made a statement uh, when I was talking about the report I did, the uh, ebook I did, the report, uh, which I believe is a balanced uh, assessment of Kamala Harris and her record. Uh, I've taken it from a number of different sources from people who are absolute supporters of her who will be voting for her and Biden in November to those who have absolutely no desire to deal with. It. I've taken whatever, but it has all been uh, embedded in facts. With, with facts being a primary issue, it's important that when I find out that my facts are off, that I come back and I correct myself and I apologize. So uh, the statement I made now, this is huge to me because it goes back like 11 years. The statement I made when promoting the book, uh, the report or asking people to get the report, which you can download from the site. I'll give you that link on here. Uh, once I upload it and everything, I'll come back and put the link in, but you can get the book on our site. Uh, it's an ebook uh, report. Like I said, I think it's a balanced assessment of who she is. Uh, I want to apologize because I don't want to be guilty of claiming or putting something on her record that she's not responsible for. Uh, as with anybody else, that's not how I want to do things. And I was wrong. The crazy thing is my whole engagement and following Kamala Harris since 2009 was based off of this fact, which happens to not be a fact. But anyway, when... I saw the video of Oscar Grant being murdered in Fruitville at Fruitville Station uh, in Oakland in, in the Bay Area. Uh, I started to try to look it up and research it. This was um, back 2009. Uh, the, matter of fact, the beginning of 2009. And uh, I looked up something on the Internet and it mentioned Kamala Harris later on down the line when the prosecution of the case started. Cam and, and I've stated that Kamala Harris was the prosecutor or the DA um, in Om Almeida at the time that that happened. And the truth is, she was a uh, she was in the DA's office prior to that, but she wasn't the DA in Almeida at that time. She was actually the DA across the bay in San Francisco at that time. Uh, I've printed a, a, a retraction. Now the crazy thing is, there's nothing about Oscar Grant in the book or in the report. He played, you know, if so it's not like that's a part of my assessment of her. That's just how I came to know her and I start following her. And so I never caught on, but something to this morning said, okay, let's go back a little further and fact check myself, research myself, because I'm getting out here and I'm putting things out. I want to make sure that I'm accurate. So I'm going back and I type in what I believe to be the heading of the article I initially read and fact checks pop up something we didn't have back then. We didn't have fact checks. You just take whatever's there and you take it and you either determine whether it's 
believable or not and it's valid or not and you run with it well the fact checks came up and specifically showed me i was wrong so here i am the same day i find out i'm wrong coming to you guys and telling you that she was not uh the district attorney who prosecuted the police that shot oscar grant in the black and if you don't understand why that could be so um so much of a catalyst Oscar Grant was one of the first times we ever saw a video of a cop shooting a black man. Uh, this is 2009. Uh, Oscar Grant was handcuffed on his stomach when he was shot. Uh, he wasn't the person who had actually started the ruckus. He was tr on the train trying to stop it. And he was detained and handcuffed while they sorted things out. And after a while, he got uh, belligerent because he felt he was being detained uh, unjustly and they came over to settle him down. Two cops held him down. Another shot, cop shot him in the back while they were holding him down. Um, that cop only got a year. Um, which, and that just never settled with anybody that, that knows me will tell you I never got over the Oscar Grant killing. Um, it's just something I can't tell you why with so many others that have crossed my desk that have hit me hard. That one just, if you ever watch my videos, I'm going to name a bunch of different people that changes, uh, you know, with each video, Oscar's name is always in it. And, uh, while we heard about Amadou Diallo, we didn't see video. While we heard about Sean Bell, we didn't see video. We saw what happened with Oscar Grant and that totally, uh, you know, really uh, hit hit home. Again, um, I have presented facts. Uh, I did not offer the vast majority of the assessment in this report. I took this report from people who actually, uh, now here's the thing. Every Everything that's in this report comes from people who believe that any politician should be held accountable for their record. Some believe that they still are going to vote uh, for Kamala. Others are neutral and others are absolutely against her, but it's all about facts to me. And I put it together in one place where that could be a balance. Uh, the extreme to the left, the extreme to the right, and what's in between, people can come. What I didn't want was anything that was opinionated about her personally. So the fact that she's married to a white man is not something that I push. Uh, the fact, all this other stuff is irrelevant in the scope of her record as a politician, while her social reality absolutely influences her, her ideologies politically. We're focusing solely on what she did in office. And uh, again, uh, I'm gonna be revising it as I see the need to bring clarity. Uh, but there are some things at the end of this thing before I give my final commentary. Uh, and my commentary is strong and it is still based on facts. What I'm trying to get at here is at the end of the day, you're going to have to make a choice. Not, I can't choose for you. I'm not going to tell you to. I haven't shown up on your page telling you what you should be doing. What I have done is what I feel a responsibility to do, and that is report the facts. I don't believe we can hold one side accountable while giving the other side a pass. I think that's the uh, bedrock of corruption in politics is because I want this person to win. I'm going to give them a pass. And when you give people a pass, it's just like kids. When you sit up and let a kid do something enough, they think it's okay and they start doing it and it becomes a part of their character. I think that we have a right to hold people accountable. I think we have a right and a responsibility to say, hey, you did this. What did you, what were you thinking when you did this? Where were your mind at? You know, okay, now you said you stand for this, but your actions were, were this. So how does that reconcile? I need to understand what you were thinking when you did that. It's nothing wrong with asking a person to be accountable for their behavior when they're saying they're representing your interests and there may be some questions as to the validity of their claim. I think that we have to be willing to sit up and say, you know what, if you're gonna, if I'm gonna give you something as valuable as my vote, you're gonna have to tell me what am I getting in return? Who am I really investing in? To me, specifically, 
Telling me that you're not Trump is not good enough for me. Telling me that you're not as bad as Trump is not good enough for me. I am not one that buys into the lesser of two evils. To me, evil is evil. You cannot extract good from evil. I don't want the lesser of two evils. I want somebody that's good. And so I don't choose my mate. I don't choose my car. I don't choose anything because it's not as bad as the last thing. I'm choosing it because I think it's what I need. And if it's not what I need, then I don't put my money in it. Now, once it's there, I'm going to do what I can to get the most out of it, but I'm not going to sit up and let buy it with my money. The same thing with my vote. To get my vote, you got to show me what you're going to give me in return. It's not free for me. If and then if my and if it's the argument that everybody makes that my ancestors paid so much for it, then it's that valuable to me. I'm not just going to give it to you for free because you're a Democrat. I'm going to give it to you because you're black. I'm going to give it to you because you're a black woman. I'm going to give it to you because you're, you know, you, you, you were a, a vice president of a black president. I'm going to give it. No. And the idea that calling out one group is automatically endorsing the other group is not really rational. It comes from fear mongering. It comes from uh, a media narrative and dialogue that if you if you if you actually call them out on something, you support. No, there used to be a time. I grew up in a time, and I was reared by my great grandfather. I'm gonna say this, and then I'll be done. That was a time that men stood on the merits of their own character. They didn't have to compare themselves to somebody worse than them to justify who they were. You could look at who they were. You could look at what they did. You could look at how they treated their wives. You could look at how they handled their children. You could look how they did business. And, 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 and you could determine within their character. They didn't have to say, well, I'm not that person. I don't do, at least I'm not doing what they did. Anytime you start talking about at least I, I'm not doing what someone else did, you're saying I'm really not that good, but I'm not that bad. That won't work for me. Not at this stage in my life. I want someone that I can look at and say, okay, you're not perfect. Neither am I. Let's step out there and see what we can do together. I can work with that. I'm not perfect, as, as this video obviously proves, that I can make mistakes. But I didn't make the mistakes with the intention of harming anybody. I didn't make the mistake with the knowledge of anyone being harmed. Most importantly, though, here's the thing. When I was made aware of the mistake, I owned it. When I became aware of the mistake, I owned it, didn't offer any excuses. I made a mistake. And the minute I found out that I had made the mistake, I acknowledged it, apologized for it, and made as much of a correction as I can. And that's all I'm asking for anybody that I'm gonna give my vote to. Own your stuff. That's part of being a public figure, is explaining your track record. We can't ask it of one side and not ask it of the other. And we should wanna know where someone stands because at the end of the day, you can't feed your kid with, we have a black vice president. You can't pay your mortgage. We, we have a vet, black, black vice president. You can't lower student loan debt for your family because you have a uh, a black female pre, uh, vice president. So we need to be able to sit up and say, you know what? This is what we have. This is where they were 20 years ago. This is where they were 10 years ago. But this is what they're telling me they're doing now. This is how I can track that. Am I okay with that? Am I good enough? Again, I make mistakes like anybody else. And I don't think the way, I don't think today the way I thought 20 years ago, not even 10 years ago. But here's the thing, anything that I've done that I am aware of that was wrong, I've acknowledged it and I've apologized for it and I've done as much as I can to make it right. When I found out that my claim about her being the DA of Almeida County at the time of Oscar Grant's death wasn't actual, wasn't factual, wasn't accurate. I'm standing before you right now, apologizing for it, 
doing a video retraction and making sure that it's not in any literature that I put out that is assessing her, that she's not being assessed on that inaccuracy. And it's not, it was never in the report. Oscar Grant didn't play a role in my assessment of her outside of the fact that he is who put her on my radar. And he is, he's still who put her on my radar. Now, the fact that the information I got about the DA at the time was inaccurate is on me that I didn't verify it. But the fact that it put me on her, on it put her on my radar and made me start following her, was, is true. Uh, but it wasn't her failure that the officer wasn't po uh, properly uh, prosecuted. That wasn't on her. That was on another gentleman. Um, so I'm, I'm personally printing the retraction uh, via video. Uh, it's going to be posted on Facebook. As long as I've got a Facebook account, this retraction will be up. And it's also going to go on my YouTube account and Instagram. So uh, it's there. And I have no problem admitting when I'm wrong. I think that's what we need almost more than anything else from our politicians is to say, you know, when I did that, I'm absolutely wrong. Uh, the one thing I can say about Bill Clinton is that uh, contrary to Biden, Bill Clinton admits that that crime bill that was pushed through um, that crime bill that was pushed through during his 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 um, presidency, he's at least admitted that he was wrong and that it has caused devastation in the black community. At least he admitted it. And that's all I'm saying about anyone. I can easily admit when I'm wrong. Uh, she wasn't the DA. Uh, but the the assessment that has been done that's a part of the report is there. It's all facts. And here's my thing to you. Here's my thing to you. If someone posts facts with no dialogue or inflammatory remarks, how is that attacking a person? We are constantly taught, especially those that come from a Christian background about accountability. But we have a big problem with allowing celebrities and politicians to get a pass because we want them to be in a certain position and we don't call, we don't hold them accountable. I ask every day to be held accountable by my children, by my wife, by my family, by the people I, I do business with. And that is so important to understand is that we have a tendency of playing both sides, being hypocritical. We will assess the person we don't like and find everything under the sun wrong with them and literally have a conniption when the one we do like get calls, get, gets called out on them. If we actually believe that there's a perfect person out there, we've got a problem and that's been our problem is that we have accepted very little in return for something we consider to be so valuable. And that's my take on it. That's why I stand where I stand. That's why I do what I do is let's, let, let's be more educated on things. And the thing is, there's nothing more I would love to see than a black woman sitting in the White House. To be totally honest, there are a few that I could think of that I would love to see right now sitting in the White House as vice president or pr president for that matter. But there are some troublesome things that I see with this situation. Number one is the person doesn't even acknowledge being black. And so me jumping on the van wagon just... And the thing is, she doesn't have to be. That's my whole thing. I don't need a black vice president or a president. What I need is a president that will be different than all the other presidents and actually do something that will benefit us, that we can actually look at the bottom line and see the difference. I don't want to be glossed over with good talk, smooth talk. I don't want to hear about, yes, I can. I don't want to hear about none of that. I want to know what policies are you going to enact? Well, he's the president. He can't enact policies. That comes through Congress. That's what executive orders are for. Presidents have been signing executive orders for whatever. Donald Trump signing them damn near every day. 
Might not be signing them for what you want to sign them for, but he's done. So it can be. Executive orders are signed. And if you follow and you actually do research, you'll know what presidents are signing in executive orders and how they impact you. That's a responsibility you have to know outside of what the media is showing you what's actually happening. And then you get mad at the people who actually read. You get mad at the people who actually do the research. We're conspiracy theories. Well, it's not a theory if the facts are sitting in front of you. Now, I know the media loves to help you categorize it, categorize it as that so that you can dismiss it. But if it's facts, it can be documented and checked. That's not a theory. It's a fact. And if it's a fact, then you got to deal with it. And that's the problem. We don't like dealing with facts that make us uncomfortable. It is what it is. I could, you know, my thing is I never ever got on this platform to be popular. I never got out here and start doing what I do because I wanted to be liked. I didn't get out here for shares and a whole bunch of stuff because uh, definitely the way approach I take doesn't produce that. I decided that I wanted to be a voice for people who didn't know how to voice or speak for themselves. And I'm in the community on a regular basis, and I'm seeing the results of what this government is doing, the results of what this uh, schools, these public school systems are doing. I'm seeing the results of what these financial institutions are doing. I'm seeing all of the results of it, and I'm going to report on it accurately. I am going to stand on the facts. If you find a fact that I report to be inaccurate, you tell me about it. I'll be doing exactly what I'm doing now. Why? Because I'm not trying to weight the scale. I'm trying to present something that my people can go to and not have to play the game of na uh, narrating through white mainstream or media who's setting the narrative based off of their own particular agenda. You got 13,000 and something uh, media outlets, mainstream media outlets owned by six different people. None of them look like me. None of them have acted upon the interest of people who look like me, but they're setting the narrative. There is tons and tons of pragmatic and empirical data that show that what we see in media, here in media, sets the tone of how we view the world around us, and we control none of it. Let me ask you a question, and then I'm going to get off of here. It's real simple. Most of us are naturally inclined to music, whether we are musically gifted or not. We tend to be able to move to music. We tend to be able to be moved by music. And so we listen to music pretty often. If you can listen to music and there's music that will get you hype for a basketball game, if you're an athlete, you got music that'll get you hype for a game of whatever it is you plan or whatever. If you got music that'll settle you down and get you mellow and calm you down, if you got music that'll get you crunk for working out at the gym, if you got music that'll get you in the mood for making love, you mean to tell me you don't think that there's power in the media to control the moods and the thinkings and the attitudes of people? Just check the, how your mood swing when you li listen to the radio. See, the radio plays music that you don't control, and so you can go from one extreme to the other extreme. Watch how your mood swings with it. The, there's power in what you open your gates to. That's why the Bible tells you to bring every thought into captivity. Why? Because when you don't, what comes into your mind controls you. What comes into your gate. That's why the second most constant command of the Bible is guard your hearts and minds, your subconscious and your conscious, because that's going to be out of the abundance of what the heart, the mouth thinks out of the abundance of the subconscious, the mouth speaks, excuse me, the mouth speaks. We have to be aware of the fact that we are exposed to a media system that is feeding our children things that degrade them, drop their standards, give them low standards of aspiration of, and all of this stuff is coming and we don't, we don't address it. We get mad at people who do address it. We just want to roll. My thing is you can't be a purveyor of any type of content, especially those who make money off of content and think your content has impact 
and not acknowledge the impact that everybody else's content has. And a lot of the content out there is directly and uh, diametrically opposed to the content that you're putting out. You cannot sit up and think that. So then when I come along, I'm going to come along and say, okay, here's what my research showed me. This is what I learned. This is what's out there. I'm going to give you my science from a psychological perspective, from a theological perspective, from a social perspective, and an experiential perspective. I'm going to give it to you. And then I'm going to tell you, take it, evaluate what you get, do your own research, and come up with an understanding of what's going on. One of the reasons why we consistently end up in last place is because we don't know how things work. We don't understand how things work and we are easily manipulated because of it. We're easily misled and misguided because of it. And we're always wondering why we end up in last place. If you think I'm lying, check the numbers. Tell me one place socioeconomically that blacks have advanced in the last 60 years since the 1963 civil rights pass, passing of the 1963 civil rights bill. That's where everybody got a new new lease on the whole voting thing. A lot of us were voting before then. So the idea that we first got a chance to vote in 1963 is inaccurate as well. But let's just say, okay, everybody's voting for the last 60 years. And here's the thing. Up until 2016, every year there was an increase in voter turnout. So we voted more and more and more over the years until 2016 when... Uh, it was no longer Barack Obama running for office. He hadn't did his two terms. Voter turnout failed. Voter, voter, voter turnout uh, declined in 2016 for the first time in 20 years. So up until that point, we are increasing voter turnout for presidential races every cycle. And yet socioeconomically, there's been no gain. Now, because we love to live vicariously through others, we see success in other people and we want to claim that as success for the whole. And it's often used as an argument against the suffering of the, of, of the predominance of our, our, our race is that, okay, this person made it, but without looking at the dynamics behind it. Is that saying, I tell people all the time, as long as I remain an anomaly among, under my among my people, I failed my people. You can't use me as an argument against the average black person for where they are because you don't know what was given to me and gifted to me and what doors were placed in front of me and what I had to do to get through them. Just the knowledge that what I, what I have done, you know, as an author, 22 books. As a business owner, multiple businesses over 30 years turning profits, you don't know how I got there. So you don't get to throw that on somebody else's lap. There's a bunch of people don't know that it was possible. I was told it was possible since I could talk. Despite my grandparents not having done a whole lot in relative speaking, my grandmother owned her own shop for years. So I had a business owner in the house. And they talked to me different. And even when they couldn't understand or believe what I was saying about myself, they never told me I couldn't. Then I got to high school and I had a high school teacher tell me, son, I don't care what goes on in life. I always remember the word can't will never apply to you. I had a journalism teacher in high school who convinced me to write an article about the fact that I didn't know my father. That article was entitled The Invisible Father. That would later become my first book, The Invisible Father, Reversing the Curse of a Fatherless Generation. I had people that saw something in me that made a path for me. There are a bunch of kids out there that don't have that. And until they do have it, until they do have equal access, we got to be careful how we handle them. And we have a responsibility to protect them. Just because you've made it don't mean that everybody has the same path and access as you. There's a world trying to chew them up and spit them out that sees them different. And to tell them anything different is lying to them and not preparing them. What they should know is, yes, there is a target on your back. But there's a way to make yourself bulletproof. Not literally, but against the, 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 the mechanisms and machinations of, uh, of racism. There's an intellectual gift in you. There's a spiritual gift in you. There's something special inside of you that will inoculate you against the mechanisms of racism, but you've got to believe in yourself. 
That's what we need to be teaching them. What we're exposing them to is a system that, look at music over the last 30 years. You can't tell me you haven't seen that it's been dumbed down, that it's lost meaning, that it's lost purpose, that it's been gussied up with heavy, super, super dope beats, but the substance of content in the lyrics has died. In R&B, in hip hop, And we've allowed it. And we have allowed it. Look, I just came for the retraction, but I just got to talking. And my passion about this is this. My thing is, don't ever think that you shouldn't be asking the people who saying they're going to represent you for receipts. And when they and when you get the receipts, you got a right to ask, well, when you did this, what were you thinking? Where do you stand on that now? How do you justify doing this? If all a person has to do is be better than the current person that you're tired of to take a role in your life, no wonder we have a 50% divorce rate in America because we're not having the standard raised of what we're allowing into our periphery. My thing is, if it's a fact, it's not an attack. It's a challenge. My thing is, show me what you're going to do for me. And here's my biggest thing. While everybody's so afraid of four more years of Trump, if the Dems don't come up with an actual agenda outside of we're not him, they're going to lose again. Because we're dealing with a new generation, and I've posted this as well. The reason that a lot of this voter turnout is on decline is because you got a new generation that's entering into the age of being qualified and eligible to vote, and they're not just going to sit up and buy into because you're a Democrat, I'm voting for you. So you're going to actually now have to actually come in and earn the black vote again. And then there's a lot of other people who are disenfranchised as well. And they're tired of politics as usual. The reason Donald Trump got any traction at all is because he wasn't a politician and he didn't talk like a politician. And as dumb as he sound and as off as he sound, he was different. And he made promises to be different. And people bought into it. And it doesn't matter whether he's delivered or not. He's just different. And I'm not saying that that was a good idea. He, I'm not a fan of dude. I'm not a fan of dude. But I'm not going to go just say, okay, you're the person that they say I got to choose from because I'm not a fan of him. I'm, I mean, we good. No. I'm not choosing my wife like that. I'm not choosing my business partners like that. I'm not choosing V. I'm not choosing nothing solely based on, well, at least it's better than the last one. That's how they get us every time. They give us two options. And then you get to ch choose which one is better than the other one. What if neither one of them is worth crap? Just a question. And the thing is, we get to demand. Do you realize, oh, I'm sorry, but there's so much stuff going on that, do you realize that we're going through a major economic downturn right now, primarily because of this pandemic. And it was time for a cycle of a downturn. We had been on an uprise since we recovered from the 2007 collapse. So it was time that uh, something come along. But check this out. During this downturn, there are a lot of businesses that are closed down. There are places that I used to usually eat at all the time, gone. Some of them not coming back. Small businesses, mid-sized businesses, and even some national chains have closed. Do you realize that means a lot of people have lost their jobs? So over 30-something million people are currently on unemployment. Others want to get on it but don't qualify for whatever reason. And there was this stimulus that they were doing as a part, the, uh, the CARE Act, where they were giving $600 extra a week to people on employment because some states minimum and maximum wasn't doing it. Uh, I know most people in Texas are getting like 207 a week if you take away that extra 600. And who can who can live on $207 a week? 
as a single person, much less as a parent with a family. Okay, so it expired in Ju July. Supposedly July 31st, but in Texas, it ended on the 25th, uh, which just happened to be my birthday. So you got a lot of people out there that needed it. The Republicans didn't want to do it again. They wanted to only do 200 or they wanted to do some other plan. The Dems was asking for the 600 to extend to the end of the year. They came at an impasse. They couldn't get, uh, they couldn't come to an agreement. So they went on vacation. Now check this out. They went on vacation on your dime. Why? Because you pay their salary. They are not missing their money. They're getting their full salary. Nobody has stood up and said, you know what? If my if the American people aren't getting paid, I'm not getting paid either. Nobody's saying that. They're getting their salary and they're on vacation until September. So you can't get some of your money back to help you get through rough times. But they're keeping the money you're paying them and saying we'll deal with it when we get back. Forget if you get evicted, because at the same time that that expired, the moratorium on uh, foreclosures and evictions expired. And so now people are at risk of not having a place to stay. And they took a vacation. Is this, you know, and all of this comes from us hiring people and giving them power of our lives. They work for us, but we've been treated like they work. We work for them. Because we lost sight of how this thing should really be because we're constantly being told how it is. You hire them when you vote for them. They're supposed to represent your interests because they work for you. But they are literally chastising you, telling you how lazy you are, telling you you need to get back to work, telling you all these different things while they eat off of your dime. Now, that's the simplified version, but at the bottom, as the bottom line... When you're looking at a country and you really actually care about what the people in that country are going through, you say, man, we're going to have to put this darn gun vacation off. We're going to have to extend this session. We need to get this worked out. We need to make some compromises. I might not like to give you what you want, and you may not want to give me what you want, but at the end of the day, the, the, the people need to be taken care of. We'll work out some of these things we got to compromise now. In a later bill, we'll fight to have it changed. But that's not what they're doing because they're not being held accountable. You got career politicians that's been there for God knows how long. And so they've gotten comfortable doing what they want to on your dime. That's why they have to be held accountable. On that note, I'm going to get ready to get off of here. You guys have a great day. I hope that uh, I've given some clarity in my retraction. Uh, but it's real important to me that the integrity of what I do is upheld. So in the times when I do make a mistake, uh, at the time I do, uh, you know, find a mistake, I, I plan on acknowledging it and uh, apologizing for it and moving forward. Uh, no different than today. You guys have an unbelievable day. Uh, hope to talk to you soon.